Now we're going to read from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord? who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a desert, a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Thanks so much for that, Zoe. There's a recent Netflix documentary called The Monster of Wall Street. It tells the story of Bernie Madoff, a man responsible for the largest theft in history. He promised investors a whopping 12% return, locked in year after year after year. Thousands gave him their money, and he ripped them off to the tune of $65 billion on their doctored-up return statements. Many entrusted him with their life savings, their greatest treasure. In the end, they had nothing but worthless pieces of paper. If they had just been warned ahead of time, no one would have ever put their hard-earned money and trust in this guy. Well, actually, they were warned. Many of them were warned and did so anyway. It was just too enticing. Imagine being that person who'd been warned, but then duped anyway, and losing everything. Imagine the end of your life now, finding out you've squandered your whole life and are left with nothing to show for it. The prophet Jeremiah had warned God's people again and again that putting their time, money, and trust into the gods of the surrounding culture had them on a fast track towards disaster. His book is written for the very people he had spent decades warning, but had been duped anyway. He foresaw that the superpower of the day would attack, and they did. And so God's chosen people were now captives 
in Babylon. Jerusalem was reduced to rubble, the Lord's temple was burnt down, and their relationship with God apparently cut off forever. We saw last week the book's programmatic verse, Derek's mentioned it again, preserves both God's words of judgment and death to uproot, tear down, overthrow, destroy. Now these were all too visceral for the audience but also words of hope to build and to plant. If the prophet's words of judgment had been proven true, they were vindicated, how much more then could the audience trust his words of hope? The words of judgment also served to help Israel learn how things had gone so wrong. While then his words of hope they point to how they might get back on track towards a bright future. We also saw last week in chapter 1, Jeremiah being called to be God's spokesperson. So today, we're going to see the very first words that God wants Jeremiah to speak to Israel. It starts off with the topic of the good old days. Look at verse 2 of chapter 2. He brings up the honeymoon stage of their relationship. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. So God's very first words are, I think, trying to establish a kind of emotional connection with Israel. Wasn't it just incredible when we were young and in love and intimate We might think of those days after the Exodus. They might not have been perfect, but but Israel was doing her part, following God's lead in the desert. And God was doing his part, like a good husband, guiding her through the roughest of desert roads. So we have an initial focus on the ideal marriage between God and Israel. It's the backdrop to the sad topic of the rest of chapter 2 into chapter, all the way through chapter 3, which focus on Israel's unfaithfulness in that marriage, her spiritual adultery. This unfaithfulness is the very reason there was an exile. And it's really the foundation of the entire rest of this book. Israel has committed spiritual adultery on her loving husband. Look then at verse 3. God now shifts the imagery from Israel as his bride to Israel as his first fruits. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them. So the first fruits or first yield of any crop was a symbol of the full harvest to come. It was to be given as a sacrifice to the Lord. It was holy, set apart to him. So if anyone dared eat God's first fruits, they could expect the Lord's swift punishment. Here, Israel herself is a kind of first fruits. She's a token of the full harvest to come. One day, our missionary God... He's going to bring in all nations, right? All nations, the full harvest to himself. So think about that. That's that's us, right? We are the nations. But in the meantime, any nation devouring, that is attacking his first fruits, Israel, they would face certain disaster. So what an amazing image then of Israel's privileged position with God. We might think of Exodus 19, where God calls them his treasured special possession. He calls them his kingdom of priests, called to reveal the true God to the nations. And then we might think of 1 Peter 1, uh, saying as New Testament believers, 1 Peter 2, I think, uh, that's us as New Testament believers. We are now his kingdom of priests. We're his special possession. So what more could we possibly ask for? Do we 
believe that? Do we, do we really get that? Do you rest in and savor the specialness of who God has made us to be, you to be, and the great role to which he's called you to? But when someone's recalling the sweetness of the good old days, it usually says something about the present, doesn't it? That is, it's not so good now. And so verse 3 introduces the topic of the focus in chapters 4, 5, and 6. This is the result of Israel's spiritual adultery. God not protecting his first fruits. Rather, he's sending an enemy nation to judge and devour them. So in the rest of our passage today, God wants to paint a more vivid picture of the spiritual adultery that brought on such judgment, all with the goal of helping them avoid yet more of it. Look at verse 5 then. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. So in verse 2, Israel was following the Lord as their new bride. Now we see they're following something other than the Lord, specifically worthless idols. Literally, the Hebrew is hevel, vapor, a breath, puff of air. In Ecclesiastes, you know this as vanity. So here's the point. Any source of fulfillment that we pursue outside of God is like pursuing a vapor, a worthless puff of air. In verse 8, we see that it's the god Baal that's most in view. Baal, as, as one scholar puts it, was the god of sex and business, girls and greed, fertility and prosperity. These things can all be so enticing, but they're all vapor. Why in the world would Israel do this? Well, verse 6 starts us off with an answer. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt? That is, in her time of need, Israel did not recall the gospel. She did not seek out her own husband that meant everything to her. The very one who saved her out of her original desperateness, who had a track record of leading her through, there in verse 6, deserts and utter darkness through the most impossible situations. And here God is implying he still wants to do this. He still wants to be her deliverer but she's forgotten him. And worse yet, she's seeking out other lovers instead. Idols, worthless idols, vapor. And and we too, we too seek after worthlessness, worthless vapor, as soon as we stop recalling the gospel. How important then that, that we're preaching the gospel to ourselves over and over. So we we need our personal Bible readings. We need our small groups, our churches, our Christian friends to keep reminding us of the good news of what God has done. Reminding us of the single greatest truth of world history that Jesus, through Jesus, God brought us out of slavery, took us out of slavery to sin, and made it possible that we could have such a special relationship with him, that we could be the bride of Christ. Look at verse 7 then. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. 
God says he's been working so hard to offer the most lavish of lifestyles to his bride. But Israel's just come in and wrecked it all. But what's the tone of God's statement here? I don't think it's the accusation of an angry judge. Rather, it's a lament. These are words of a wounded lover. So I think God is displaying a certain vulnerability here. He's been hurt. And he's recalling the former days of intimacy with his people. His heart breaks at seeing his first love in the arms of another. I think we're supposed to be struck by the reality that that God experiences something of this, this real inner turmoil when we look elsewhere to have our needs met. You might have experienced similar kinds of rejections. I can recall some rejections from decades ago, remembering how I would lament how all the best girls would always go after the worst losers. (laughs) It used to be number one on my life's list of most perplexing questions. How can you have divine sovereignty and human free will, but how can you have all the best girls always going after the worst losers? I can now see I was probably a bit of a loser in my own way. But the obvious difference here is that anyone standing next to the Lord is by definition an absolute loser. Yet here's Israel. She's run off on the Lord. She's abandoned him, chasing idols. Her first love had rescued her from Egypt out of a life of oppression and abuse where she felt hopeless and empty. He provided her a secure, loving relationship. He's taken her into the poshest of neighborhoods. Verse 7 there, I brought you into a fertile land and a a place of amazing wealth, comfort, and security. Who could possibly say no? Well, Israel could. And it wasn't just the common people. Verse 8 there, it's Israel's spiritual leaders, those most responsible for directing Israel's relationship with the Lord. They're implicated there in uh, verse 8. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. The result is, in verse 9, Therefore, therefore I will bring charges against you. The Lord is taking her to court. He's put up with being cheated on for centuries. He's now ready to withdraw all his good gifts and send her away. In verse 10, God testifies to the ridiculous, even shocking nature of this whole turn of events. It says, cross over to the coast of Katim, that is in the far west, and send a Kedar in the far east. Now, observe closely, see if there's ever been anything like this. And, And really, everywhere in between, has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Look around the world. Not one other nation has switched its gods. We live in a world where people switch religions about like they switch their mobile phone operators, I think. But, but this just, just didn't happen back then. And what's more, did you see in the parentheses there? These gods Israel's traded the Lord in for? They are not really gods at all. It borders on the absurd what Israel has done here. So verse 12, Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror. Do you feel the weight of this? Uh, A closer look at the Hebrew might drive it home even more. So let's go back to verse 11. 
They've exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. There's a play on words going on. The NIV is taking liberty here with the phrase worthless idols. Here, it's not rendering hevel. It's rendering what woodenly might be translated, what does not profit. They've exchanged their glorious God for what does not profit. But glorious God in the old NIV is rendered just glory. So it doesn't have to refer to God. It can refer to just great treasure, actually. So you see that through a play on words, at one level, Jeremiah is saying, Israel has traded in great treasure for what does not profit. Like trading in their life savings for worthless pieces of paper. For a long time growing up, I had the itch to go to Las Vegas and try my luck at some slot machines. Back then, it was the only place you could go. So one day when I found out I had a layover in the Vegas airport and there were slot machines there, I was pumped up. I finally had my chance. Yet, when I finally stood in front of my first slot machine, quarter in hand, I extended my arm to drop it in. I just couldn't do it. The thought of pulling that handle and trading even a quarter for absolutely nothing was just too much to bear. But of course, Israel, her treasure or glory that she's traded away, this is not just a bit of pocket change. Glory as our new NIV makes clear, can also refer to the very presence of God himself, the supplier of our needs and so much more. And she's traded him in for promises, empty promises of something better. And remember where the audience is of this book, in exile. With the temple destroyed, They live in the harrowing reality of the loss of the Lord's presence. They really have lost God's glory. Be appalled, O heavens, and shudder with great horror. There's one more wordplay that's helpful to look at. So let's go back to verse 5. Try to stay with me here and and going into the detail. Uh, They followed... Hevel, really this could be translated. Hevel appears twice in this verse. They followed Hevel and became Hevel themselves. See what's going on? I think here's the point. We were all created to reflect some kind of image. If we're not going to reflect the image of the glorious creator, it'll be the image of idols and worthlessness. Worthless idols will conform us into their image, and we ourselves will become worthless. Trading God's glory for worthless idols, then, it's not just about cutting ourselves off from God's blessing that he wants to rain down on us. Our Our whole beings were created to reflect God's glory and image. So we trade that glory in to our own detriment. So this is really worse than being duped by Bernie Madoff. It's worse than exchanging great treasure for nothing. We're talking about being robbed of the very significance, of our very significance as human beings, out of the very thing that gives us life and meaning. So as we we push God away, we actually empty out the very substance of our souls. Idolatry. It, It chips away at the core of who we are as God's image. It sucks all meaningful life right out of us until we're left with nothing of value. 
course, to be able to avoid this, we need to ask, well, what are our worthless things that we pursue that end up making us worthless? What takes Baal's place in our culture? Well, Baal was the storm god. His specialty was to provide rain. Without rain to yield good crops, well, empty stomachs, starving babies are right around the corner. Imagine, everyone around you says your survival hinges on bowing down to Baal. You going to do it? Yet, the super wealthy Israelites weren't quite so much living hand to mouth. They'd piled up such an abundance that it wasn't their longing for survival they were so concerned about. It was, and and, and really, that's leading them to spiritual adultery, right? But it wasn't their concern to just stay alive. It was really their longing for the good life. I think that's where most of us are here in Australia today. These longings that turn us away from the Lord, well, they they often take the form of longing for more possessions. A new car, a bigger house, new clothes, a faster computer. To fulfill such longings, there's not really a cultural pressure to invest in some kind of divine being, is there? Or an idol, Hardly anyone believes it's a divine being that makes a decisive difference in determining whether they get what they want or not. The ultimate controller for whether we get what we want, I think, is our bank accounts. So we expend great amounts of time, energy, and trust trying to amass more wealth. We even have an expression, the almighty dollar. Money is a powerful God we look to to provide us with the good life. And so the New Testament links idolatry and greed closely together. At other times, it's the possessions themselves that become our gods. We trust in them to give us a better life. Really, anything that we look to for a better life that steals our time, money, and trust away from the Lord becomes a false god. Or maybe what we long for isn't things, but people. We become heavily invested in obtaining a certain kind of relationship with someone. And if we don't get it, our relationship with God is thrown off track. That person or relationship, or maybe even a group of people, they become our god. When you have these unmet longings, whether for people or for things, do do you cry out and say, where is the Lord who has delivered me in the past and wants to keep delivering me now? If you do, it might look like spending extra time with the Lord, focusing on his gospel, finding a new contentment in being his special possession. might also look like finding fresh enjoyment in the many blessings he's already poured out on you. But it's tricky, isn't it? Tricky to identify such false gods since so many of them, uh, what we're talking about, can be good things. Having a big bank account or a nice car or a great relationship, these can be very good things. But I was always wrong to invest in, to trust in. So it really comes down I think, to a question of motives. We're called to really wrestle it through with God. So I've got a couple of diagnostic questions here that have helped me as I've come before the Lord on this. First, we can ask, what are the things without which I can't be content? Which I've got that gotta have it mentality. And then, What are the things that consume an inordinate amount of my resources? It's been said that anything we're willing to make a sacrifice for, besides the real God, becomes a false God. 
John Piper said, great desire for non-great things is a sign that we're beginning to make those things idols. We might say great investments of time, money, and trust in non-great things is a sign we're beginning to make those things idols. Another object of longing that often leads to spiritual adultery today, I think, is our longing to be entertained. How many of us invest too much time and money in viewing the latest movies or reading up on the latest news or gossip? We often end up trusting the almighty glowing screen to meet our longing for excitement or maybe just to overcome boredom. Another nice thing about Baal, you see, was Baal worship offered a quick fix to your longings. Just say the, say the right prayer. Just perform the right ritual. You've done your part. Just plug it in, touch the button. Better than no batteries required, there's no relationship required. No need for self-examination. No need to get into the weeds and ask questions like, am I out of step with the covenant? Am I somehow damaging the relationship? There's no relationship required. When you long to be entertained, do you cry out and say, where is the Lord who has delivered me in the past and brought me into relationship with himself and wants to keep delivering me now? If you do, well, it might look like filling more of your time doing things that encourage someone else. It might look like spending less time in a certain game or other app. Or possibly with being okay, not seeing that latest Netflix series, even that one on Bernie Madoff that everyone's talking about. A final object of longing that can lead us to spiritual adultery is the longing to feel significant and admired by friends, family, or even strangers. So we invest our time, money, and trust into things that can make us significant. Our passage today really addresses this one head on, doesn't it? God says, we don't have to do anything to be significant. There are no methods. You are my bride. You are my first fruit. You are my special possession. Just place your life in my hands alone. And as we do, we step into God's designed role. We reflect his glorious image, not worthlessness. Now that's true significance, isn't it? Well, verse 13 gives us one last image. It sums up this whole passage. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The custom was to dig a giant hole in the ground and line it with clay to catch the runoff during the rainy season. But the water was always in danger of becoming stale or contaminated. Why would anyone become heavily invested in digging a cistern to hold stale water? When there's a spring, a spring of fresh living water nearby. But it's worse. These cisterns would often develop cracks that kept them from holding any water at all. This is the danger for Israel and for ourselves. That we spend our entire lives slaving away on our cisterns, though they will never ultimately hold a single drop of water. They'll never bring true life. All the while, we've got a spring, a spring of living water who's ready to gush forth the most real and satisfying life imaginable. The gospel says that in Christ, 
we've been set free from the slavery of digging empty cisterns. Paul says in Galatians 4, now that we know Christ, we're slaves no longer. When I was 18, I gave my first church sermon. I still remember how nervous I was, and I still remember what I talked about, the shortness of life. And I talked about how I only had two more sets of 18 years left before I'd be 54, and largely looking back on my life. Sorry, Associates People <laughs> program out there. Uh, but I ask, at, at that point, did I want to look back and see that I'd wasted those two short sets of 18 years chasing my own dreams, my own desires, storing up treasure that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal as a prophet greater than Jeremiah has said, we could say. Or, though it might be hard at times, did I want to use those two short sets of 18 years to invest well? This year, according to my former self, I'm largely looking back on life. I can't claim to have to always have invested well, but I can say that God has never once let me down along the way. And I'd like to think I'm not completely looking back on life. So if so, then I've got a lot of choosing left to do. Choosing to follow God over all the enticing alternatives, it's, it's not a one-off decision that you 18-year-olds out there, you bridgies out there need to make, or even you 25-year-olds or 35-year-olds. It's not a one-off decision. It's actually a day-by-day, even hour-by-hour decision. May God keep us all from investing badly, investing our lives in cracked cisterns. May we be people who hour-by-hour Call out to Christ alone, who wants today to be our spring of living water. Amen.